I teach a class called Jesus in Contemporary Culture where we basically look at Jesus films. We try to examine the different types of Jesuses that appear, especially in contemporary Western culture. So you got the masculine Jesus of, of Mark Driscoll and Fight Club who, who likes to basically get on people MMA style and ground and pound them. You have this uh, flower picking hippie Jesus who, uh, you know, sounds like this and would never hurt anybody, but hi, I really, really like you, and let's go have lunch. And You know, we have so many different Jesuses that appear in these Jesus movies, and uh, uh, a lot of times they just seem schizophrenic to me. I love to talk. Yeah. I love the sound of my own voice. It's one of the sweetest things, actually, That's in the world. So. <laughs> That's so my name is Christopher Skinner. I go by Chris. And I am a professor of biblical studies, specifically in the Department of Religion at the University of Mount Olive, which is in Mount Olive, North Carolina. It's a tiny little town in the eastern part of the state surrounded by uh, cotton farms and um, pickles and things like that. Yeah, so I really like the focus of the companion series. I like the fact that uh, the goal is to take these really broad and um, really important topics in the Christian theological tradition and make them accessible to a wider audience. And uh, generally speaking, uh, in my work as both a teacher and a scholar, I've come across so many works that um, are intended to be accessible. And most of the time I find that either they're um, shallow, a lot of fluff, and therefore not really useful, or they're written by scholars who are, even though they're trying to write in the language of the ordinary person, they're speaking to other scholars and so therefore genuinely uh, unhelpful. Um, and so what I really tried to do with this book was take all of my best teaching illustrations, all my best preaching illustrations, basically uh, my personal experience with the Gospel of John over the last 15 years of, of teaching it and preaching it and talking to people about it and writing about it at the scholarly level and, and put that into a format where uh, students could walk away and become, what I say in the book, a more perceptive reader of the Gospel of John. I mean, that's what it's focused on. Um, how to understand the narrative flow, how to understand the major themes when you interact with something that maybe you might not have a frame of reference for. Uh, I try to take an illustration from real life, from popular culture, things from my own life, things from um, uh, music, movies, television, uh, my wife as a reader, uh, how we interact with characters, um, and help readers understand the unknown in light of the known, which is something I try to do in my teaching a lot. Take something that people already have a, a level of familiarity with and um, help them understand something new in light of what they already know. So that's really what I've tried to do in the book. Uh, when I first started studying Greek in seminary, we started by reading the Gospel of John and, and I was uh, sort of blown away by a lot of what I was seeing. But then, uh, having gone to a good Protestant seminary, right, they, they focused almost solely on Paul in our exegetical seminar. So um, we had a, an exegetical seminar on Philippians, we had an exegetical seminar on Galatians, and on Ephesians, and on Romans, all of which were great, but I, I really felt like I wasn't uh, getting enough of the Gospels. And so I took, a, I took a really great exegetical elective, I think my third year in seminary, uh, on the Gospel of John, and um, I say in the book, it's, uh, I say this in the book and in another book, it started a love affair from, from which I've, I've never recovered. Uh, I just, it, I find it intoxicating. I find the subject matter intoxicating. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a topic of perennial interest for me. Yeah, so, so John is, obviously emerging later than the synoptic tradition, you know, possibly 20, 25 to 30 years later than our earliest written gospel, the Gospel of Mark. And so I'll just make a comparison between uh, Mark's Christology and John's Christology. You know, many have argued that Mark has a, a high Christology, um, and that's probably true uh, if you read Mark as an autonomous narrative. Right? But uh, when you read the Gospel of John, you see a completely different type of Christology emerge. Whereas in the Gospel of Mark and in the other synoptics, uh, Jesus is constantly pointing to God. And the Gospel in, in those Gospels is um, 
the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus is walking around everywhere telling everybody about himself. Uh, through these uh, I am statements, we have what are called the unpredicated I am statements. You know, before Abraham was, I am. Um, and then we have these uh, um, predicated statements, which was I am the bread of life, you know, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, the life, I am the resurrection, the life. And Jesus is um, making the locus of the gospel, the locus of salvation, the locus of, of everything himself, whereas we don't see this in the synoptic gospels. So that's just one point where um, the gospel of John differs markedly from the presentation we see of him elsewhere in the New Testament. As the churches began to do their things in, in various different locales, different Christologies had different trajectories. And um, obviously the early church was moving in the direction of um, proclaiming Jesus as divine. And I think that uh, this element of John's Christology is key to every other element in the story. Um, everything else that I, I try to talk about in the book, um, you know, the development of characters, the development of the story, um, the various different themes related to um, the coming of the paraclete, or um, Jesus' return, or um, Jesus' um, descent down to earth, or Jesus taking on human flesh. All this is ultimately related to him being um, divine. So let me, uh, let me back up and say that, and I try to deal with this in the book, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of casual readers of the Bible, pe you know, people for whom this book has been written, um, will sort of pick up the Bible and assume a one-to-one -one correspondence between what they read in the New Testament and later Christian formulations, right? So, you know, we talk about the Council of Chalcedon where we, you know, we have officially sort of dogmatized this idea that Jesus is both fully divine and fully human, right? I don't want readers to think that uh, that's what we get when we get the Gospel of John. I, I wouldn't say that um, Jesus equals God is the type of formula we get necessarily in the Gospel of John or even in the prologue, but we're moving toward that. And I think that's key to um, John's understanding of what Jesus has accomplished in the world and what Jesus continues to accomplish in the world as the paraclete works with those who are his own. He definitely uh, states very explicitly, I have overcome the world, right? Um, and so uh, what do we mean by the world? This is a slippery uh, you know, concept in the New Testament. You know, the cosmos has, has a number of different meanings. And the cosmos, the Greek word for world, um, you know, and uh, I've done a little bit of writing on this elsewhere. Um, the cosmos in some places refers to sort of the created order, right? Which, which for John is a good place, but is also filled with, with, with human evil. Um, the cosmos, though, also stands uh, for um, what we might call in the language of, of Christian tradition, like, like fallen humanity. Um, and the representatives of fallen humanity appear throughout the gospel. You know, we have um, people who oppose Jesus. We have um, this slippery phrase, hoi dioi, the Jewish leaders. We have, um, you know, uh, in the garden we have a, a Roman cohort. Uh, who comes to arrest Jesus along with some temple police, along with uh, one of Jesus' disciples. There's all these different um, emissaries of the world. And, and Jesus proleptically announces, you know, I've overcome the world. You know? And so I, I think that's a big piece of how John envisions what Jesus accomplished, not just in his ministry, but on the cross and in the resurrection. So I try to deal in the book with um, not just the concept of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism, but how readings of the Gospel of John that lack a certain nuance have perpetuated anti-Semitism anti and anti-Judaism uh, throughout the centuries of uh, Christian interpretation of the New Testament. Um, I think uh, when we deal with the, with the Greek word you know, people take it you know, in an unadorned way, they just say the Jews, and you know, therefore the Jews um, of all time are responsible for the death of Jesus. And I think this is wrong-headed. I think the preaching that stands behind it is, is wrong-headed. Um, 
uh, in the book I deal with, you know, this distinction that's developed within modern scholarship of should we refer, refer to them as the Judeans, as, you know, uh, the concept of Judaism as a religion you know, may not have been completely operative in the first century in the way we think of religion. But then uh, other people are, are unhappy with that, uh, specifically uh, Jewish writers who are working on the New Testament. They say, well, if you take the Jews out of the narrative, then, you know, uh, you're basically one step away from Arianism. I actually I have a quote in there where um, A.J. Levine has some really good work that she's done on um, keeping the Jews in the Gospel of John. And so uh, when I teach it and when I talk, about, talk to students about it, I like to say that um, it's okay for us here uh, to narrow it down even if the word is the Jews, in the instances that we look at most time, it's a, it's, a, it's a very parochial group of Jewish leaders who have gathered together to oppose Jesus. But, I mean, it is unfortunate that um, this word is not explained. I, I tell uh, my students that uh, reading the, the gospel, reading the, reading the New Testament a lot of times is like listening to one side of a phone conversation. Right? Um, it's very easy to misunderstand what's going on when you're listening to someone else have a conversation and all you hear is one side. And, and I think we get that, not just uh, in the Gospel of John, but also in, in the Johannine epistles. We are, we're hearing the result of one end of a phone conversation. I mean, for the most part, everybody in the Gospel is Jewish. Um, Jesus is Jewish, the disciples are Jewish, um, those who are responsible for writing the gospel are Jewish. And so um, there's a coded language that people use. You know, imagine two people get together and they're talking about their roommate who keeps eating their cereal. And they say, well, he's at it again. That guy just won't stop. And, and we're listening on the outside and we're like, well, who's, who's he? Who's that guy? We really don't know. The people who were involved in the conversation, the principals who were involved in the conversation, they know good and well who he is. They know good and well who that guy is. And so I like to tell my students the principles that we're reading about, you know, um, the author or authors and the audience that received this gospel, they knew who Hoyu Dayoi was were intended to rep represent. And so our job is to try to understand the other side of that phone conversation well enough to, to where we don't perpetuate anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism and our preaching and our teaching and, and how, we, how we try to live out the gospel. The question of whether John was even writing to a community, and I, again, I'll use John in scare quotes because we don't know who John was. Um, that question has actually come up for debate in recent years. Now, I actually think there was a Johannine community. Um, there's the sort of uh, Richard Bauckham uh, Gospel for All Christians, Gospels for All Christians school, where they, where they argue that um, you know the gospels were widely disseminated early on, and therefore this means that they were not intended for communities. Well, I think this argument is flawed, especially as it deals with the, the Johannine uh, literature, because not only do we have a gospel, but we have these three letters that seem to be written with much of the same language and imagery that are reflecting a, uh, what I think is a community in crisis. So um, I go back to the work of Ray Brown and. and um, Lou Martin on the, the Johannine community, and I think you know a lot of their work was very speculative, but there was something there that was a, a kernel there that was um, uh, solid, and, and you know. The, so I actually buy into the, the two-level reading of the Gospel of John, and I, I think he, I think the Gospel is being written to a community, a community that's in some sort of crisis with respect to how are they going to understand Jesus. There's a hymn we used to sing in the church that I grew up, uh, and one of the lines is "Fightings within and fears without." You know that, you know, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And uh, that's what it, it seems like to me, like there's, there's fightings within the community, there's fears on the outside, there's all sorts of things that are going on. But I, I actually do, um, I think that there's something to the, the Brown Martin School of there being a two-level reading and there being a very distinct community that's receiving this gospel. All right, so, so students, um, often come to the Gospel of John with really a, a very strong appreciation already. Uh, a lot of students that I have, um, because I'm at a small school, they'll have me for an introduction to the New Testament class, and then if they want to take me for something else, they will. But a, a, a lot of what I say in that class is if you really want to understand a lot of uh, the trajectory of Christian theology as it relates to the New Testament, you look at Paul's letter to the Romans and you look at the Gospel of John. Right? Those, those two writings were so foundational for so much of what goes on in later theological development. So students already come in pretty sympathetic to the message of the Gospel of John. In fact, I find that getting students to read the other Gospels autonomously um, and 
not through the grid of what they think they already know about Jesus is more difficult. But I also have to back them off at times and say, okay, you, you're looking for a Jesus in the Gospel of John that is fully divine and fully human. But again, that's, that's 450 years later. Uh, that development is taking place, but that's not dogmatized until later. So let's read the text autonomously. And the experience that I've had uh, so often in teaching the Gospel of John is that students come with a, I call it a mosaic Jesus. You know, they take several pieces from Mark, they take several pieces from Matthew, a couple pieces from Luke, some stuff from John. They mash it all together and they create this sort of strange Jesus mosaic. Uh, somewhat like uh, some of the Jesus movies we get where one moment Jesus is saying and doing something very Johannine and the next minute he's doing something very Markan and, and he seems almost schizophrenic. So my real goal and the goal in the book is to get students to read the Gospel of John from beginning to end and understanding John's unique autonomous and authoritative message about Jesus. Before we ever go anywhere else, before we go to Mark, before we go to Matthew, before we go to Luke, or even Thomas or some of the you know, stuff outside of the canon, what does John say about Jesus? And you really can't say anything else um, with respect to the New Testament until you understand what John has to say, and then you can start comparing messages. So that's the ultimate goal. I find that, that students are sympathetic to that, but I find that students are also resistant to that because that sort of approach, the narrative approach, really challenges a lot of their preconceived notions and a lot of questions that ultimately become very difficult. Because if, I, you know, if, if there's a Jesus that they have constructed in their head already, um, they, don't, they don't want anybody screwing around with that. They, 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 wanna, they wanna keep that intact. You know, yeah, challenge me on minor details of the text. I like, I like it when you tell me stuff about the periphery, but when you mess with that stuff at the center, you're also messing with the stuff that's at the center of my theology, and I'm not crazy about that. So I've seen sympathy and I've seen resistance. I don't know that I've ever seen a good John Jesus movie. I mean, too, too many Jesus movies, um, they superimpose the grid of Trinitarianism, um, Chalcedonian Christology, you know, elements of the Nicene Creed. I mean, there, it's, I don't know, I just haven't seen a Jesus film that I think is really, uh, really good, other than ones that are, um, I'll tell, actually, I'll tell you my favorite one is uh, Jesus of Montreal. Have you seen Jesus of Montreal? Yeah. yeah, that's probably my favorite one because uh, it captures so many things in such a poetic way. Frankly, I find a lot of Jesus films just boring, right? Like I find a lot of preaching to be very boring. Um, and that's because um, people come to the script, right? they come to the script of the Gospels um, with an idea uh, sort of in mind. And they, there's no creative tension. There's, no, there's nothing creative about what they do. And, uh, they're gonna, just going to tell you the story of Jesus and hope that in all of its majesty and power, it resonates with you and it, and it draws you in. And most of the time you're like, yeah, I got, I got nothing, right? Um, the thing about Life of Brian is that it does it through parody, it does it through comedy, um, it does it through ridicule and mockery. The thing about um, Jesus of Montreal is that it does it through um, picturing Jesus in a, in a modern setting, but doing, doing it in subtle ways that you ultimately don't get until you're completely arrested by it. Probably another uh, one that's really evocative for me is The Last Temptation of Christ because um, it's so uncomfortable to watch. I mean, the, the early scenes, and I think this is intentional, they're so slow, you know, and you got this like really wild man looking Willem Dafoe who's like looking at people with big eyes and, and you're like, why would anybody follow this guy in the first place? And you get a feel for how weird it might have been for people to actually follow around this guy in the first century, so. But I, I don't think there's been a good one done where um, where John has been the basis, um, and if so, it would probably err too much on the side of Jesus' divinity, which is what most Christians do, which is what most preaching does, which is what most stories do when they talk about Jesus. So when I, when I try to teach the Gospel of John, well, let me back up and say I was a pastor for um, better part of a decade, and I did, did a lot of preaching through the Gospel of John, through, the, through actually through the entire Bible, but uh, through the Gospel of John several times, through the Gospel of Mark several times. And um, so I try to do, whenever I try to enter into the stage of, of how is this relevant, how, why does this matter today, I try to go back into that experience and, 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 uh, and draw from sort of the preaching side of what I did. So how, how do you make 
the Gospel of John relevant today in light of you know, what it means to read this? I think the first thing is that um, people get sucked up into the story. If you teach them how to read the story, um, as opposed to the sort of propositional teaching that we get, like Jesus did X, therefore you go do X, or Jesus said don't do X and therefore don't do X. People get swept up into stories. Uh, the, the reading, the hearing of a good story uh, can be a vicarious experience. And it, it seems to me that when I teach students how to read the Gospel of John, they begin to understand it for themselves. They begin to understand the relevance for themselves a, li uh, a little bit more clearly than I could ever sort of go point by point and say, this is why this is relevant. Um, with respect to the characters, I, I love teaching the characters because um, the characters in John consistently fail. Few things resonate as well with modern followers of Jesus who fail and who fail to understand him than stories of people who knew him and walked with him, who failed and who misunderstood him. That seems to me to be of immediate relevance, both in teaching the Gospel of John and occasionally in preaching the Gospel of John. So you notice that the, the postscript is reading John theologically, question mark, right? Um, and this is not because I'm opposed to, to, to a theological reading of John, but I find that theological readings uh, of the New Testament often lack nuance because they're so focused on unity uh, and they don't see the diversity that exists. You know? And, you know, because I do spend so much time talking in here about how John is so different from the other Gospels in the way that it understands Jesus and the way that it understands how his disciples respond to him immediately and, and um, how much longer the ministry of Jesus is in the Gospel of John than it is in the Synoptics. Um, that when I have the question mark there, reading John theologically question mark, I'm not, I'm not saying is it possible? I, I think it's possible, and, and as a Christian, I think it's necessary, but I, I'm asking for, with that question mark, I'm asking for nuance. You know, if you're gonna do this, uh, proceed with caution, proceed with nuance, and, and do the best you can to live within the tension. I guess I'm, uh, what I'm trying to avoid is a tidy, a tidy world, because the world is messy, um, the church is messy, Christianity is messy, the New Testament is messy. Um, it's not as you know. It's not as clean as we would like it to be, and there's lots of things that that cause trouble if we try to tie it up in a in a nice little box, put a bow on it, and say this is our New Testament. It's messy, and so the uh, the the question mark I have there is, is about you know essentially caution, you know, proceed with caution. You know, slippery when wet. You know, whatever you you know whatever you might say. My uh, doctoral supervisor, uh, Frank Maloney, um, obviously a prolific New Testament scholar, but um, his reading of the Gospel of John is what sort of, I would say, awakened me from my dogmatic slumber, right? So I'm in seminary and I've learned to read uh, Greek and Hebrew fairly well, and I feel like that's undermining a lot of the other stuff that I'm learning. And so uh, I turned to narrative uh, on a whim. I turned to narrative. I read Alan Culpepper's Anatomy of the Fourth Gospel. I read uh, Dewey Rhodes and Mickey's Marcus Story. And then I thought, I need to find something that's going to get me deeper into the elements. And I, I ran across Frank Maloney's uh, trilogy on reading the Gospel of John, which was published with Fortress years ago. Wiffenstock has reprinted it. And um, it was like the scales f fell off my eyes. Like, this is, this is not just what I've been looking for, this is what I want to do. It's a, a historically informed narrative reading that notices the nuances of the text, that, that catches the flow of the story from beginning to end. And so um, that reading that was what led me to, to want to go study with him. And then studying with him was a, was a completely different world than I had thought because uh, he's such a prolific scholar and such a well-known guy. Um, and a lot of times you expect people like that to to be standoffish or to put you off. And um, as, as amazing of a scholar as he is, he's that much better of a human being in terms of how he treats people, um, how he listens to your arguments. Uh, I, had a, I had a semester where I, I couldn't, I thought I was not gonna be able to pay. Um, he called me to his office one day and, and uh, was about to give me a check, a blank check. Here, you can pay me back whenever, I don't, I don't care. I mean, just uh, so pastoral, um, such a great teacher, such a great scholar. And so um, having read him, I thought, this is the type of stuff I want to do. And then having studied with him, I thought, this is the type of person I want to be.
I have a, a book right now that I'm editing on Johannine ethics. Uh, I actually have two other works where I'm hoping to look at, uh, as I said, how the ethics of John can tell us something about the history of the Johannine community. So that's something I'm really uh, interested in, really passionate about. Um, but I will we'll continue uh, working across the gospel tradition, especially um, comparing and contrasting the different Christologies that we have uh, in the gospels. I'm really interested in, in how we got from, you know, 70 CE, the gospel of Mark, to, you know, 95 to 100 CE, gospel of John, and how markedly different they are. So I probably will continue working in that area. Thank you.